As we talk about for playing these critical thoughts, Game Dev Discourse is a loop, not a spiral. And a new addition to the loop, it seems, is with the discussion of the infamous yellow paint. That mysterious substance that just so happens to be over every door, barrel, climbable wall, breakable wall, breakable barrel, breakable door, or anything else that you can interact with. And you have defenders and critics coming out of the woodwork on social media about it. So for today, we're going to discuss why this is unfortunately still an example of bad design, but it's also one you can't always escape. Now, unfortunately, I was going to wear something yellow for the video today to make all of you listen to me. And unfortunately, I literally don't own anything yellow in my house. So I'm going to let Future Josh work some magic right here and see if this will work. Alright, now that I'm yellow, all of you must obey everything that I say. You must all go out and buy multiple copies of my books. At least 50 copies of every hardcover book. You must like and subscribe to this video. You must send me money on a daily basis. You must obey me while this yellow is going on. And there's nothing you can do to stop it. When we kind of look at the history of how the yellow painting has come about in AAA games, it has really been a byproduct of the push to more higher realism or higher fidelity graphics, especially during the PlayStation 3 and on era. This idea that now you can render entire mountain sides and villages with all manner of miscellaneous stuff and doors and locks and gates and all that. How the heck is a player supposed to know where they're going to go? As we've talked about, when you have massive environments, or even just very small but very like content-rich environments, like you're in a warehouse and every shelf has a different item that is completely rendered in 4K HD, and I just cause a programmer and artist to lose their minds as I'm describing this. How is a player going to know that one little widget or MacGuffin on the aisle 6 section J in corridor L is the correct key that you need to open up the door. And this is when we got to this idea of providing the player with greater hints and greater clues as to what is happening or where they need to go. We can even go back to the infamous here is the objective marker. You need to go right here. Do you see this? Do you see this? You need to go right here. It's right here. This is the objective. Go right here. Go. Go. Do it. And it has been a joke for some time. And as the industry has continued to grow, and as graphics became more and more uh, in-depth and more realistic, so has the need from a lot of developers to provide better signposting for where the player needs to go. And this becomes even more important when we're dealing with games built on action or very rapid motions and movement. If the player is in a chase section and at any moment they fail, they have to repeat the whole thing, they need to know immediately, okay, this platform is climbable, this is death, I shouldn't go here, this is the right way, and so on and so forth. But we run into problems when it comes to, once again, the strong argument on both sides as to whether or not you should include paint in some way, shape, or form. So, the first point, let's talk about things from the critic standpoint. That yellow paint is completely unrealistic, it breaks immersion, blah blah blah, and all that. And the most solid defense about this is that, yeah, that's right. The point about using yellow paint in this regard, much like the same use of detective vision, objection, objective pointers, and so on, is that it's meant to be a slap in the face of the player of, hey, you can use this. This is the right door. This is an item that you can pick up. And for games, again, that when we start to get to more content-rich or environmentally rich games, you need to have some kind of signposting. In a perfect world, every player would be a master explorer and know immediately 
where they should be going, what they should be doing, and what items they need at any given point. But when we talk about the general consumer, just general play for most games, it's very easy to get lost. For titles where you have massive buildings, complete neighborhoods, maybe you have to explore a tri-state area, it's important sometimes to just let the player know, okay, of 87 different buildings in this town, this one has a key you need. And when we look at things from this perspective, again, part of what makes good game design good UI UX is allowing people to get past or mitigate any potential or major issues that can come up with a game. And without having any guideposting, any kind of details or hints or tips or whatever, a lot of people are just going to stop playing a game. If they get stuck in a level for 20, 30, 40 minutes because they missed that one blue sign that was going to direct them to a, I don't know, windmill, and in that windmill they would have to climb it in order to reach a lever, which will then open up a door on the complete opposite end of the town, where they can then grab a lever that they can then insert into a fountain on the other side of town to then open up the town hall in the middle of the town, they're not going to want to deal with all that. And we'll probably get completely winded by the end of this video with some of the descriptions I have coming up. Now let's move to the other side of this. And this is when we hear from people defending these and saying that they are required or they like to come down as being demissive of people arguing that it conflicts with a game or doesn't feel right. And this gets at the heart of some of the points that I brought up previously. So there's developers who are very obsessive about having difficulty settings, auto win options. Basically, this is when we go to extreme quality of life features. But you see, this is where it gets weird in terms of game design and what makes good, bad, and middle kind of level and environmental design. Clarity and just readability will trump everything. This is what you must always strive for when you're building a game. No matter if you're building a shooter, RPG, open world, linear, puzzle, whatever kind of design. Everything needs to be readable. It needs to be clear and understood by the player. Now below that, we have realism and immersion. This is when we start talking about stuff like environmental storytelling, which will come back up in a few minutes. Diegetic GUIs. This is when you want everything to fit within the space of the world. If people heal by jumping up and down on a green platform, have that fit within the world of this game. Maybe there's commercials and advertisements for jumping on green platforms. Who knows? And then below that is when we get to kind of the extreme Again, like signposting, extreme quality of life, the yellow paint, the detective vision, the objective markers, and so on and so forth. But the problem arises when we look at people who defend at the extreme points of view. That should either be 100% realistic immersion, all diegetic at all times, or every game must have yellow paint, it must have guide posts and signs and tutorials and all the pointers that you can imagine because people need that. So from the realism side, the problem is that if you build your game entirely about that with no attempt at providing onboarding, guidance, tips, hints, whatever, then it can turn to this nightmare of navigation where you have a mall and it's a completely 100% original mall. Every store is its own custom asset and own custom look. And there's like 80 different stores in this place. And you tell the player, find the blue paperclip. Just go. Go look into 80 different stores with completely different arrangements of office spaces. And I just caused a game developer to, I think, jump out a window somewhere. Again, this is not fun. Yes, it's realistic. Yes, it's immersion or immersive. 
but is that really going to be enjoyable for someone to do? Now, if we look at it from the other side, this idea that every game must or it needs to have this kind of stuff, this gets at a point that I've talked about before. When we look at games that provide kind of like the story mode option, where you turn off all gameplay, where you kind of remove literally every pain point imaginable from a game. And I've said that there are developers who will swear by this, saying that it is important for a game to have these features. But as I've pointed out many times, if someone can only experience your game with every encounter in your RPG turned off, every amount and variety and shade of yellow paint on every single object in your game, then you have messed up somewhere when it comes to the GUI and the environmental design of your title. Because there are some games, and we've seen this, where that yellow paint is all that stands between you solving a puzzle and you having no idea where to go. Where the solution is, hey, there's a locked door in front of me. I am supposed to go over there, climb that drainage pipe, leap across scaffolding to get to a lever. I pull that lever, which then shows me a cutscene of a gate opening about 20 feet away. I need to jump and rush over to that gate before it closes in order to get in to get to a puzzle. That puzzle is one of those annoying ones when you have to like match like three or more things when you hit the buttons, one button will trigger like two or three of them. So it's like that nightmare scenario. And then once you solve that, you get a key. But that's not the key to the door that you need. That's the key to the secondary door, which the yellow paint will guide you to go up, go through a few more uh, platforming sections to then open up that door. Once you get in there, you have a fight. You beat that fight, you get the main key. But then to get back down to the bottom floor, you need to go down to the sewer section, which requires you to slide down and make a lot of precarious jumps down, all guided by yellow paint. Also, climbing a few walls that have no discernible markings on them other than that yellow paint, to then make it back to that door to open it up to get a checkpoint. And my, I may be collapsing due to lack of oxygen by the end of this video. And as I've said before, when we look at these extreme examples, while it is necessary to have them, your game should not be balanced or designed around their use. And one of the developers I was following on Twitter X had a really good point, that in most cases, the use of yellow paint of these extreme senses of uh, signposting it's not done because the developer has a real, real love of painting everything yellow. It comes about when you're doing playtesting in the final hour and everyone can't figure out where is the lever in this room to open up that door over there. Despite the fact that you have a giant a blaring light on this lever that's in the corner. And in order to do something that is quick, something that is fixable, or something that is quick, cheap, and effective, well, yellow paint works. And in these extreme circumstances, you again need to have something. But this gets at one of the points I wanted to talk about what we've discussed before when it comes to UI UX. Good UI UX elements in a game, especially GUI elements, they are not there to make someone ignore the problems of your game. You want your game to be as readable as possible. You want your environments to actually be visibly distinctive and clear to someone playing them. And if someone can't find that lever because you hit behind five boxes that all have the same color as that lever, yes, the yellow paint is handy, but it doesn't or did not fix that mistake that you put into the game. And this is what we've talked about before, that while you should have these features, they consider them like an emergency parachute or an airbag in a car. They're very important to have, but your car or your vehicle should not be built that every time someone gets in for a drive, that they're going to need to deploy them. And if your car 
the brake pads don't work, then something else is kind of causing a problem. And here's a good example of what I mean by this. During Next Fest, I played many, many, many games, and one of them was a Souls Light. So in the Souls Light, I got completely lost. I had no idea where to go. I went left and right, up and down, back and forth, in and out, couldn't figure out where the next part of the level was. I started to think that maybe I broke something and the trigger wasn't right. And then I noticed a ladder on a wall, and that was the correct route. Now, you see, someone is probably getting ready to type a smug comment down below, saying, well, I guess Josh needed the yellow paint after all. But you see, hold on to that for one second. I'd like to ask all of you a little question. In this room, or in this area that is dark, very dark at night, and the wall is a dark brown color, what color do you think the developer made the ladder in this darkened area on a dark brown wall. What possible color do you think would stand out or should be used in a very dark area with a very dark brown wall? Let me know let me know your answer in the comments down below. And this is a good point about this. That when we have issues or when we have problems in a game that someone is having trouble, whether it's not understanding how GUI works, where to go, what is happening, the best solution to this would be to focus more on that level design. Now, if that's not the case, if it's way beyond the scope, if we're way past a point of altering a level, then yeah, yellow paint it up. Do like a, maybe here's a update for Power Wash Simulator, yellow paint simulator. Design the hand-holding for a level using a giant pressure yellow paint shooter. If the developers want to credit me for that, let me get in touch with me and we can work out a deal. But if you have to rely on these elements, if this is the only way that someone is able to figure out your game or play through it, then that is a sign of a not designed well title. And this is something, again, that you have to understand as you grow as a developer. You want to be improving how you build your games from title to title, from level to level, and so on. And if you just rely on these elements as a 100% catch-all to any issue, a lot of people are just not going to enjoy your game. And the reason why is that if you keep making these mistakes, and you keep hoping that approachability options, assist modes, and stuff like that are going to kind of smooth out those problems, a lot of people don't want to deal with that. They don't want to have to press a button every five seconds that says, you're supposed to go here now. Now you're supposed to go over here. Now you're supposed to go over here. Now it's over here, and there, and there, and here, and there, and everywhere else. The reason why some games do get away with this, like the Dead Spaces, the Arkham games, is that it's built within, again, the lore and the setting of the game. Batman has his super fancy detective vision. Isaac has that lovely rig that gives you that nice, like, neon path along the ground. Now, is that still kind of breaking? Yeah, it still is. But again, as I said earlier, clarity and readability will always be better than realism. And you want to make, if you can combine the two, you can build stuff like this directly into the GUI and into the design of the game, so much the better. It's one of the reasons why we harp a lot on the environmental design and level design of Valve's games and stuff like Left 4 Dead and so on, where They'll have an area where all the doors have, you know, bars on them or it's like covered with trash and filth. And you know that you're never going to move all that stuff. But there's that one door over there with a big old light above it and the door looks like it's partially open. So maybe, just maybe, that's the right way to go. And when you can build or when you can catch these issues before they become a problem, 
it leads to better and more interesting designs. And again, at the end of the day, if you need to have yellow paint, if there's no way around it, it is better to just cover everything with yellow paint than to have someone struggle with your game. But you don't, or you should strive not to have to rely on that. Whether it's by making things that are interactable more apparent, making them stand out more, making the rest of the environment not look as detailed. There are plenty of ways of making something very readable and improving the clarity of an area. And if you can do that, and if you can learn to do that before it gets to the playtesting session of your game, this will make you a better designer. It will make you a better level designer and a better environmental designer. And these are the things that allow you to improve. Because again, most people will put up with issues and confusion and maybe the first game that they like from a developer. If they're somewhere in that same problem, 5, 7, 10, 15 games deep, they're going to be a little bit frustrated. And more importantly, if you don't correct these issues and you show your game to a new consumer, someone who hasn't played your last five, seven games, whatever, and they are completely and utterly lost as to what is going on or what they should be doing within five minutes or within 30 seconds of playing your game, there's no amount of yellow paint that's going to convince them to keep playing. They're going to leave and never come back. And again, the proof of these issues will always be in the churn rates of games. That even if you literally give the player, I automatically win every fight button in an RPG, you may still lose 40, 50, 70% of your player base before they even clear one hour of it. And again, it's why you need to be able to understand and grow and stop these issues before it's too late. Because if you can catch them while you're in the middle of the design stage, if you're able to think about this stuff long before a playtester gets their hands on it, this will make your job a lot easier, it will make your levels a lot better, and it means you can not have to spend as much money buying all those gallons and gallons of yellow paint. So, here's a question for those of you watching. Can you think of great examples of signposting in a game that is 100% fits the world, the setting, and the theme? It may still be 5 billion percent gamey, but it doesn't feel as, I guess, apparent as just throwing yellow paint around. And what are your favorite shades of yellow? Let me know as well. That's going to do it for today's video. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to do the YouTubing stuff people will tell you to do. If you're interested in more of my thoughts on design, check out my books wherever they are sold. Visit our Discord and Patreon and come back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom where you some of the art and science of games.